Okay, everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, we'll be back. We are now back with our next series of talks, and we will start it off with Will Hardy talking about protecting personal data because it's the law. <laughs> Hello everybody, um, my name is Will Hardy, I'm a software engineer with a law degree um, and while I liked the legal world, I preferred to build things, so um, I never really knew what I wanted to do with that degree, um, but now I have something to do. Um, I'm here to talk about the GDPR, uh, if you haven't heard anything about that, well done, um, but for those of you who have absolutely no idea what the GDPR is, uh, while you're getting thousands of frantic emails uh, talking about this GDPR thing, allow me to be the one to fill you all in. Uh, 2016 GDPR is a 40 kilometer wide asteroid on its way to impact <laughs> mainland Europe on the 25th of May 2018. By an astonishing coincidence, the EU Parliament in 2016 <laughs> announced a regulation called the GDPR, and it will take effect, and I'm not making this up, on the 25th of May, 2018. Uh, for my own sake, I'm going to ignore the asteroid completely and focus on the hypothetical peaceful life in the European Union after the regulation takes effect. Um, by the way, I'd like to warn the transcribers that I am another Australian, but I've been living here long enough to learn to speak a little more slowly, I'll also say data, not data, and there's not much I can do about that. Um, so, what is the GDPR? Uh, it regulates the processing of personal data. You probably... <laughs> you probably already have similar laws. Um, there was an EU directive in 1995. But, uh, so a lot of this isn't new, but the scope and the enforcement of the laws has changed dramatically. Uh, it is a regulation and not a directive. So the directive in 1995 was just sort of asking the member states, please, could you maybe do something like this? But now the regulation is a law that applies everywhere in the EU simultaneously and has the same laws. Um, as a user, it's much needed, I think, and wonderful regulation. You may have already noticed a, w a lot of wonderful emails telling you all about your rights in recent days and recent hours, um, and asking for your consent. Uh, you may already have a warm feeling of trust in these EU companies that are now asking, telling you that they will handle your personal information more safely. And you still have this feeling of control over your personal data. You can delete anything, uh, or you have this feeling you know things will be handled properly and safely. I'm not sure if this feeling is valid. Um, the timing over the recent concerns, public concerns over Facebook's algorithms is, has maybe made this a bit more interesting and uh, it's nice to see such attention coming to this uh, in the last few days. Uh, the regulation itself isn't that big. I had a copy around here somewhere. It's, um, it's have a feel, uh, feel free to read through it. It's not too difficult. Uh, the first 30 pages or so are just recitals telling you about uh, what it should be doing, um, and they're not really binding. The, after that, you have the articles, which are the sort of the binding bits, and they're all nice little chunks of information that's easy to get through. The first 34 of these are uh, relevant for us. Uh, after that, it goes on about setting up all sorts of things that we don't really care about. Um, we'll go through some of these articles in a minute, and the... There are a couple of interesting ones towards the end, um, but uh, have a nice read and you'll be fine. Um, the most important thing is, of course, just don't panic. Um, you still have plenty of time left <laughs> um, to, to organize your sites and get everything organized. Uh, I'm here to talk a, mainly not uh, like a lot of other talks and articles and and, and things that people have been saying. I'm here to talk more to the people who build the technology and not the managers and, and anyone else who is uh, trying to figure out what the law means. So there's a lot of information for those people and enjoy that. Uh, there's a whole internet full of that. But um, for us, we, um, we're more about we're building the system. So um, we'll probably maybe get told what to do. Uh, maybe someone will say, this is what I need implemented, or the lawyer says, this is okay, so maybe do it this way. 
Um, but I think it's important, um, even though as a, an employee you're not personally um, uh, responsible for compliance, uh, no one's going to attack you personally, it's the company, um, I still think that there's a professional duty for anyone who calls themselves a fancy name, like a, a, a software engineer or an uh, evangelist or a data scientist or anything like that. Um, when you advertise yourself in this sort of a professional role, I think there's a professional duty to uh, be on top of these things. And this regulation is really central to what, uh, to what we do as an industry. Uh, and if you don't know it, you're, you're not really uh, trained in what your profession is expecting of you. Um, also, if you care about your employer, and not all of you do, but if you care about your employer, then you'll be helping them comply uh, in a really effective way. Um, you're at the front lines, you know the details of the data, you know uh, how everything fits together. Um, and the people who are making these decisions, the lawyers especially, have no idea all the sort of details about what's going on. Um, a good company might set up a, a, a way of communicating uh, between you and, and the people who make the decisions, but it's not always the case. So if you have a good eye for how things work and what might be private data or personal data and might, might be this, uh, you're going to be extremely valuable for your employer in helping them comply. And if you're valuable, then maybe you might that turn into compensation or something like that. You'll have to negotiate that with your bosses. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'll just go through maybe three, three things roughly, some key concepts, some terms, so that you understand what it's all about um, exactly. And then some of the rights that we as users and your users as users uh, enjoy um, or should be enjoying. And third is just some sort of jobs and tasks that we uh, as people who build software have to do. Um, so. First of all, uh, just as a, a, a diving across from the, the, the development world into the legal world, terms in the legal world aren't fixed as they are in software. There are, there, are no, there are no types that you can define and there's no categories that very cleanly say this is personal data and this is this. It looks like it might be that way, but it's not really like that. Um, for example, the term personal data um, this is the definition from the, from the regulation. It's deliberately broad and it really encapsulates a whole lot of things. But for example, like your, your name and your IP address, some cookies, the device IDs, um, all sorts of online identifiers are included in indirect information, but it doesn't always mean that it is the case. If you have a, a collective IP address that's probably not personally identifying, if you have a name uh, that's John, a first name, that's probably not in itself personally identifying, but if it's collected with other things or if you have a very, very unique name, then, uh, then it is suddenly uniquely identifying or identifying. Um, Basically, get a feeling for anything that relates to a person is personal data. So, and that person that it's relating to is the data subject, um, lovingly named. Processing is also something very broad. Um, it means any operation, I mean, the text is here, but I print it off and stick it above your workplace. Um, it's anything that involves the collection, recording, structuring, it's anything basically you do with data. Um, storage included, uh, if you're not looking at it, it's still processing it. Um, Data controller. So here's now some more interesting terms. A data controller is a special, um, it's an organization or a person in a professional context that uh, basically collects the data and controls how it's uh, used and for what purpose, or controls the purposes that it's used for. Um, if it's purely personal, if it's just between friends, not included, uh, you'll be fine. But as soon as someone else is involved that's maybe in a commercial context, then uh, they are a controller. Um, there are lots of exemptions, um, don't worry too much about those, but um, the data controller also doesn't have to be in the EU. So Americans with the smirks on your faces, uh, if you have EU citizens or data subjects in the EU, you uh, should also be complying with this. Um, it's, it's broad, but um, I, it's, what's important is that there are two different types of uh, entities. There's the controller and there's also a data processor. 
And the data processor is the person maybe the controller gave the data to. Um, so they've collected the data from you for a specific p purpose, but they've given it on to somebody else to do some work because they couldn't be bothered doing it themselves. Um, freelancers, you are a data processor, potentially. Because you're not an employee um, and you may be processing personal data, that's your role in the system. A processor has less duties. Uh, you probably won't be asked specifically for consent or you won't be asked to delete things. That all goes to the controller. Um, but you still have some responsibilities uh, and we might get to that. Finally, there's also, or almost finally, special categories of data which are um, anything revealing racial, uh, ethnic origin, political opinions, religious, and so on. You can read it all there. Um, this is... Uh, notice that gender and sex is not there. Um, it's an interesting omission which will come later in discrimination. But um, these, anything that comes under these categories uh, then has to be treated with a bit more care and has some other rules that it has to go with. Um, get to know these and understand, because if you recognize that flowing through your systems, um, you really should maybe be doing something about that. Uh, finally, there's also the idea of profiling. Um, it's called out by name, and it has a special definition, and it has uh, some extra rules that also pertain to it. Um, the it is very, very broad as well as the others. Um, if you look at the categories, they seem specific, but you can probably fit a lot of stuff into those categories. Um, this will come into effect when uh, for discrimination and so on. Uh, but that's all the terms. There, I only uh, listed a few of them, but they're the main ones I think sort of us writing the software should know about because if you recognize any of them uh, and you're probably in the best position to recognize them, uh, it's something you should maybe alert the company or the organization to what's happening. Um, so, as a user, we get some nice nifty rights, and this is the exciting bit about the legislation. Um, transparency is the first one. We finally get to find out what they're doing with the data and who's actually using it and who's not really using it. Because if they are going to use it for a specific purpose that's outside of your contract, of outside of what they're going to be doing with it, they need to tell you about that. And it's been interesting in the last few days getting the emails telling me all these services that you didn't realize were doing something with your data are doing something with your data. Um, what does it mean, uh, what you have to do here? It's not really your concern. That's in people in charge of the company uh, should be doing that sort of thing. But that's basically some, a right that we as users get to enjoy. Um, right to access the data. So as a user, you get to see what they have about you. And this will be in a, a day's time, we'll be able to see uh, what all of these companies have. They should be providing it electronically. You can either submit a request, or if they uh, don't want to deal with that, an automatic something built into the system of you somewhere. Uh, but can you answer these questions? Uh, uh, what data do you have about me? How did you get this data? Why are you saving the data? Um, and who are you giving the data to? If you can't answer these questions, you have about a month to answer uh, if anyone asks you. Uh, the right to rectification is interesting, um, but for us it means can we correct the data? Like, Does your system allow the data to be corrected? Um, have you fed some things into the machine learning algorithms and you can't change that anymore? Um, if you just have a field in the database with a Django admin interface, then you're fine. You can just tell an admin to go in and change it. Thank you, Django. Um, but you might want to add a simple view to let the users do it themselves. Uh, thank you, Django, for enabling that as well. Uh, the next right is erasure. Um, so anyone can say, please get me out of your system. Um, you probably also don't have to decide when and what to erase. That's hopefully coming uh, from the people who make the decisions. But you have to know that it's technically possible. Um, can you erase your users from your system, from your backups? Um, and if you do have backups and you restore a backup, do users who had erased themselves suddenly reappear in your system? Um, this can happen for a number of reasons. It's not just um, if they don't consent or withdraw consent, they may object to processing or the data may no longer be necessary for the reasons why they were taken. Um, the next right is data portability, then it really affects us, if we're building systems, then we have to build systems that provides their data in a structured, commonly used, and machine-readable format, um, which isn't 
too difficult to do. Maybe we already have Django serialization. Thank you, Django. But maybe uh, it's just something that's a bit awkward in your system, or maybe it's something you have to build. Um, you have 30 days to do it, but you might want to automate that. The um, user can, and this is something that's not talked about too much, the user can ask for themselves to be flagged in your system, to say, please stop processing me, uh, but don't delete me. Uh, it's a sort of like a, a funny bit of the law that's sitting there somewhere, but you have to be able to do it. Um, I doubt you'll get uh, a request for this. Maybe you will, um, but you have 30 days to comply, so maybe you can wait for that and wing it. Um, but is someone going to surprise you with this request uh, a week before it's due? Uh, could you please make that happen? Um, the next one is also a right to object to automated decision making. And this uh, may only affect some of you if you have systems that do completely automated decision making. Is anyone here from Shufa? No? Good. Um, there is uh, already this law in Germany. Um, Germany was one of the countries that, that already has these things. Um, but Schufa managed to get around that. Schufa is a credit agency in Germany that's loved by everybody. And they managed to get around that by having a token person in their process uh, click a button. And that meant it wasn't a completely automated process, and they managed to, to sidestep that. I don't know if that will work with the new regulation. We'll find out. Um, the right to object um, is, is similar to the removing consent, but it's uh, for also for the times where you didn't collect consent. So maybe you have a system saying, like, these people consented and so on, but they can still object if, even if, they, uh, if you didn't get their consent. So what things do we have to do? There are lots, uh, but I'm going to list some things that maybe aren't completely talked about everywhere um, and some things that maybe address us specifically. Um, a core aspect is this idea of by design and default. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, it does, it's not entirely clear and specific, but, um, and, and that makes it hard to comply exactly, but um, it's, it's sort of important, and it means you're trying. And if you give it a good go, you'll be fine, I guess. Um, so taking into account the state of the art, the cost of implementation, la, la, la. Django already helps you with this because it, it the framework itself uh, encourages best practices. Uh, the documentation pushes you even further in that direction and, and helps you to learn about best practices. And the community even more so. The community um, offers third-party frameworks that allow more techniques for best practices and conferences like this where you learn um, about how to do it properly. Um, so in that sense, a lot of us uh, probably don't need to care as much about this. We probably all know somebody who does need to care about this, who's storing passwords in interesting ways, who has insecure systems, who send data sets via email to uh, 400 recipients in the CC field, and so on. Um, there's a lot of detail in this. Um, I think they, they mention things like pseudonymization, Yeah, OK. Um, and that is uh, basically what we already have already. If you use the Django uh, Auth app, um, the, then you will probably have a model that has all the user information in it, or some of it. And that will be linked with an identifier that's pseudonymization. Um, everywhere else in the system, or if you pass it on to other things, uh, don't pass the personal information. Don't pass the... the um, don't pass the email address, don't pass names and that, pass the, the number and ID or generate a UUID if you're using different systems outside of your Django system. Uh, data minimization isn't really built into anything. You have to do that yourself. Just don't collect everything you see under the sun with the hope that maybe I'll one day use it. Sit down and have a think about what you might actually be using the data for. And if you don't need it, then don't store it. Um, Build, try and try and automate and build a lot of these things into your into your systems so that it doesn't you're not relying on someone to remember it or think about this and it won't cost you any extra time later if it's automated if you're encrypting uh, field by field um, I'll talk about that a bit later if we have time um, integrate maybe the purpose for which the data could be used processed into your system so that uh, it's clear at every stage what you can do and can't do um, and maybe provide APIs if you're providing data to other people with inf like automatically restricting or anonymizing data before it gets used. Um, 
We could take a small technical detour. I think we might have time. Um, basically, let's, let's try to encrypt sensitive data by field. I thought we can do something with Django. Um, if you do encrypt data in fields, you're not going to be indexing it or sorting it anymore. I hope you can live with that. Um, make a decision if you're just going to do them individually or by groups, uh, and what libraries you might use and you trust uh, to do this properly. Um, I would hope that maybe in the future Django might offer something like this uh, that, that does it in a safe way uh, and that allows things to happen. So if we have a little model maybe that we have uh, 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 names, by the way, an uh, interesting fact, it was the first email address uh, that we know about. Um, the real name, maybe, maybe we don't want to keep that public. Maybe, um, maybe we want to hide this from server admins, from data analysts or the support staff that are looking through the admin. Um, and one way to do that might be, if it's extremely sensitive, like uh, medical data, might be to uh, encrypt that. So we start with an unencrypted version, and then we, be, we install the encrypted version and uh, then have a function to get the decrypted version with a password. Problem, of course, is that uh, this only happens when you log in because you don't have the password anymore. So we'll encrypt it with like a content key that you can get once you supply the password at login and, and store it somewhere. Um, but that is then only for one user. Um, you could set up another model to, uh, to encrypt the same content key for each user that needs it with their password. Um, but that's also something a problem because then you'd have to store the uh, content key for the whole session, and, and where are you going to store that? Um, so you would then probably maybe have another key, a user key, uh, that you can store somewhere. Um, you can either store it, half of it in, the, in memory or a session and, and the other half in the browser and use um, uh, secret um, sharing to, to bring them together and provide access. Um, something like this, would then uh, be able to encrypt data within a model per user. So it's no longer a system-wide encryption, it's a per user encryption. Uh, and what you've done is you've, you've managed to, to, for your backups, if you delete the key, then you don't have to touch your backups. Deleting an encrypted file or deleting en encrypted data just means throwing away the key. Uh, so if you want to use encryption, it's a good way of deleting things, of uh, sort of um, shredding them by, um, by just throwing away a key that's not part of your backups, that's not part of your systems. And if you keep everything separate, that might be a lot easier to do. Um, a couple of notes on this. Uh, make sure you use maybe like an initialization vector um, so that um, the, the same key, like data won't be revealed because you have none, 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 and we can work out that this hash means none. Um, or, and make sure that um, you don't write something like this ever yourself. Um, so this should also be something that's part of a framework. Um, using, if you store the way you do it in the uh, key like the user passwords do in Django, then that will help migrating data later uh, if you change your algorithm or your method. Um, erasing personal data might be straightforward, but um, you'll probably have problems with your linked data or your backups. You've got one month to work that out. Um, by separating maybe your backups. If you have a, uh, a one backup for your account data and one backup for your non-personal data, then um, you can maybe keep the non-personal data a bit longer. Or you can re-encrypt the other one in another way, um, but you can just maybe manage it a little bit better if you do that. Um, the idea of crypto shredding before uh, with the throwing away the key is the same uh, idea if you've encrypted the, the account data on a per user basis, then you can just throw away the key. One other thing that the regulation brings that's new is, um, or in some jurisdictions, is preventing discrimination uh, based on special categories. And this, um, this is basically when you're having algorithms for like uh, pricing your shoelaces or something, um, if you, you can't include any of this information in your algorithm to decide who pays more or who has a legal effect. Um, 
Another important word here is the word revealing because if I have uh, maybe a date of birth and a postcode, I might be able to identify a lot of people that way. Um, combining different forms of data can identify people in ways you might not have. So if you use that data, especially postcode data, if you use that, you may well end up being discriminating against people. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do properly, um, and we should be doing it properly, and we're learning about this at the conference. Uh, and there are lots of people, lots of research happening. Um, you'll hear about bias in algorithms. Uh, learn about it. If you're writing algorithms that make uh, decisions for people and how much they pay or whether they get a loan or anything like that, learn about this stuff um, and try to prevent it. It will make your algorithms better in any case because um, you're, you're looking at the, what's actually um, important instead of some other things. Um, also note that uh, gender and age is not included in the special categories as we saw before. So you're free to offer shoelaces uh, more expensively to uh, one sex than the other. Um, you will maybe run against other discrimination law in other uh, aspects of the EU legislation, but in the GDPR you'll be fine. Um, don't, inf don't forget intersectional, um, so if you have, you may be sort of controlling your algorithms, you're testing them, you're auditing them, but if you're doing it for just each category specifically, you may miss that uh, some people who live in two categories at once will then get discriminated against. You have to check these as well, and it's not easy to do because there are lots of combinations. Um, ways to attack this, uh, there are... Um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work on this sort of thing, and I'd, I'd encourage you to go and do about that. It's probably outside of the scope of this talk, um, but you can remove data points, you can um, uh, anonymize the data, uh, and uh, there are ways of, of addressing that that might be worth doing. It may slightly um, not improve your algorithm, uh, but I think it's, there is a bit of research showing that the, uh, the fairness, when you increase the fairness, you can get a lot of gains in fairness for a little price in, um, in, in how good your algorithm works. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem of, of multiple optimization. You could maybe include it. If you audit it, it's a probably the best way to do this because you're not allowed to collect special data categories without a very good reason. Um, it may not be possible to be fair. It's, it's a question you might have to ask, um, and I think we'll find out in the next few years um, how far we come with that. Um, what's another thing that I won't go into too much detail about is the idea of explaining machine learning. Um, this can be very difficult uh, because there might be a right to explanation of an algorithm. So if some, a user comes to you and says, uh, tell me why you made this automated decision, uh, you may have to be able to explain how that happened. If you're using machine learning, if you've got a, a deep neural network, you have no idea what's going on. Um, it's not going to be easy. There is research in this area. Um, look into it, ex explainable machine learning. Um, it's, it's hard to say whether this right even exists to an explanation. Uh, it's early days yet, well, it hasn't even started yet. But it'll, it'll clear up in the next few years, I think, uh, and we'll, we'll know what we need to do and whether it's part of it or not. Um, it, the, there are reasons, I, I won't go into the details, that it, it might not actually exist because um, because it was removed explicitly from Article 22, and so on and so on. Um, in Germany, there's, there's an also a translation of the law that says it has to be about the envisioned effects, and so on and so on. Um, look into this so you can have a chat about it later if you're interested in that. What is interesting is maybe the idea of anonymization. Um, Doing this is really hard, and if you don't have any experience in anonymization, don't try it alone uh, without maybe getting into the research of this. Um, basically, it's asking a question, is re-identification reasonably likely? And the only person who can answer that is maybe you, um, because the lawyers have no idea um, whether this data can be combined in a way that uh, might allow re-identification. Um, one I mean, uh, one, this can also be very helpful. If you're working on anonymous data, you're avoiding model overfit if you're, if you're building models for machine learning, um, which means uh, instead of um, having one or two people in your, in your database um, tell your model something that's wrong about, uh, about the world, you'll anonymize it and it will be, the information will be generalized. Um, it, 
it's if you don't know things like the, the K anonymity and, and L diversity T closeness, uh, find out about them or ask someone who does. I'm sure there are lots of people in this room who know how to do anonymization. Uh, it's hard. Um, it's I, I just I, I'll just leave it there because it's it's something you, you really shouldn't attempt yourself if you don't know about it. Um, finally there is the final thing of breach notification. And this is something you have to know because um, if you don't tell anyone uh, about the email that you accidentally sent all your users with the personal data or something, then uh, your organization will be liable. You have to tell somebody because uh, within 72 hours, it has to be registered at the uh, local authority. Um, you may have to also inform the relevant data subjects, uh, and this can be very easily easy to trigger. Um, it also means loss of data or um, anything that sort of makes the data poor. Um, if you send an email to the wrong person uh, in CC or something like that, there can also be a data breach. A lot of innocuous things can actually turn out to be a data breach. Um, finally, what I guess for, for Django, if I could think of any sort of random tips that I could stick at the end of the presentation, these will be it. Um, maybe set up a proxy for external services to protect your users. If they're connecting directly to Google Fonts, then uh, Google is suddenly getting their IP address and the user didn't know about that. Um, so you can either get their consent before you do that or uh, you can set up a proxy so that the user is just connecting to you. Um, I had more on that, um, but we'll continue. Um, what can Django do? Um, I guess we'll find out in the next few years, um, but maybe allow, enable, um, facilitate safe per user encryption. Um, maybe uh, include a lot of uh, documentation that's specific to GDPR to help people comply using Django. Um, and maybe even to tag personal data from the, from the model uh, onwards. Um, where you can say in the model that these fields uh, are storing personal data or in combination with these other fields this might be, and so that we can track it through the system, so that we can handle it in a view in an admin and say that these users can't see personal data or that um, this purpose has been attached to this data and um, a view can then check, uh, am I allowed to use this data because I want to use it for this purpose? Um, Maybe it's something for the sprints if people are keen and eager to, to get into this sort of stuff. Um, but I think in the end, um, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens in the next few years. What we're experiencing now is more probably the more painful part of it is the, the transition. But I, I, I think in a few years, everyone will really know what we have to do. Everyone will know um, how we're supposed to work. Everyone will know um, what we can and can't do. It'll be get easier, it'll get more fun, and we'll all have access to our data. Um, so thank you for, for your time. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them, but I'm, I'm not going to answer questions on compliance specifically for you if you have things like that. But uh, general philosophical questions or clarifications are good. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we have a first question here at the microphone one. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I say this with American legal training, so things are a little different. Um, it seems that one of the hardest pieces to implement, just thinking off the top of my head, is the sort of decline for processing, where a user wants to remain in your system, but it just seems like there's so many code paths that that can go yeah. down and stuff like that. Um, can you decline to implement that right and just say, you know what, we're not giving you that ability, and you can choose to erase or not? but we're not going to allow you to decline processing? Yeah, it's a good question to maybe, like, I, I think um, you can just say, well, I, if you erase them, you're no longer processing personal data, so you're no longer um, uh, attached to the GDPR. It doesn't apply to you anymore. Right. I, I guess a, a deeper question is, does that maybe... Um, impact poorly with other rights of use or, or something like that, or, you know, contractual rights that they had to use your system. Probably, yeah. And yeah. it means okay. you have to look at your contracts to right. make sure that uh, these scenarios are covered. Okay, um, thank you. But not you personally, the lawyers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The other questions from the back microphone? Yes. Um, at some point, you uh, mentioned taking personal data. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there are some data which are borderline. For example, if I do business with you, assuming you're a freelancer, I will have your name as a business partner. Mm -hmm. I cannot delete that because I need it for legal reasons yes. for my contents. Yep. I also have your phone number, but you didn't give me your business phone your number because you don't have one. You gave mm -hmm. me your personal uh, phone number. So do you have any insight on how to indulge this kind of things? Uh, not entirely, but there are uh, lots of exemptions for, for business contracts and, and things like that. When you do get into the borderline data, um, then uh, it's a case-by-case -case basis. And I think a lot of lawyers will often give you answers. That there's no yes or no for a lot of things. Sometimes there is, but sometimes it's just, we, I, I don't know, maybe. Um, and if you then get into the corner cases, that you can argue for this or you could argue for that. Um, but there are exemptions that help you continue to do business with your freelancers. Um, and if you look through those, you'll probably be covered by most of them and you'll be fine. Um, but uh, of, often you can do this on a case-by-case -case basis anyway. If someone asks you, please delete my phone number, you can delete their phone number pretty easily. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, another question from that microphone. <coughs> Hi, I um, just want to say thanks for the really good talk. That was really good, thanks. Um, the other thing is, <coughs> sounds a little bit flippant, but um, it said about the on your earlier slides, you were talking about unnatural or natural people. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what is the definition between a natural person and an okay. unnatural person? Um, a human, I guess, is a natural person. Uh, a corporate body is, n is could be a legal person, but it's, it's not a, a human, so it's not. Uh, so if I have personal data on a company, it's not personal data. It's, yeah. Okay, there's another question at the microphone at the back. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question. Where did you know all this stuff from? In the internet, there's a lot of stuff, and everybody says something different, and how to know which parts are correct and which ones to follow, and yep. yeah. Um, okay, so first you could read the uh, legislation. It's not too difficult. Um, I have a copy back here, if you want to look at it. Um, and it, secondly, there, there are a few uh, lawyer, uh, um, legal companies that provide guides to it and you can trust them if you trust them um, and there are a few opinions um, and in, in reality a lot of you don't really know there are some uh, legal articles from scholars that argue in both directions for an ideas like the the right to explanation um, and they're good arguments both of them like I sort of agree with both of them and we won't know um, we'll find out in the next couple of years if, if people bring in cases to, to, uh, to judges and we'll find out, to courts. Um, but other than that, um, you never really know a, a definitive answer to a lot of things. Um, most of the time it's reasonably clear-cut and it's a risk uh, analysis situation. Um, is it worth doing that or what are the consequences of doing this? And I imagine at the beginning, the authorities probably aren't going to come down too hard on smaller companies. And they probably won't come down hard on the larger companies with good lobbyists either. But there is also a right to sue. Uh, so a user can uh, say, I don't like what you're doing with my data and, and take you to court. And who knows what will happen there? I, don't, I have no idea. We'll find out. It's, it'll be interesting times, I guess. Okay. Another question in the front. Um, is there any provision in the law to uh, prevent end users from harassing a company, like um, asking every other month for the new data they collected or so? I mean, in some extent, um, the, the recovery of the data, or especially cleaning backups, is, um, is actual work, mm -hmm. be it in implementation or even if it's a manual task for smaller companies. Um, which costs money, which yep. is not something I can easily argue. There was previously in a lot of implementations of the law, so other countries had that, um, and they would allow maybe the first couple, but if you have too many, then uh, that would be, you, you could charge a fee for it or something, but um, it's now free and should be automated. Um, and I think the emphasis is on that you build systems that do this for the user automatically and you don't have to. Um, do it for every individual user. Um, I'm not sure there are probably definitely ways you can harass um, if you look for very specific things that uh, companies might not do. I don't know if that's, uh, I haven't 
m seen anything that, that points to that in the legislation. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, thank you very much, Will, for this amazing talk yes. and for taking so many questions. <laughs> thank you very much.